Unite. Unite. Break it down. Unite. Unite. Amanda. Away to. Good morning, everyone. It is absolutely, absolutely brilliant to see everyone gathered here today. Thank you so, so much for coming here on an early and cold Johannesburg morning. To everyone tuning in on the live stream, whichever part of the world you're in, thank you for, for being here with us. You're very much here with us. And it's just been awesome to see everyone gathered together in one room again, some old faces, some new faces, some introductions, some faces that I recognize from a Zoom from a few months ago, but only seeing you for the first time now. And I think when we're gathered here today, our main aim is precisely to bring us all here together, to be together as we reflect on this definitive moment in South African history. So I'm going to be very brief, but before I begin, I thought it was important to extend some thanks, some thanks to Claire Lester with whom all this began, whose initial idea this was, putting out a feeler to gauge whether or not there'd be appetite to host an event, to Rosa Luxemburg, who have generously sponsored today's event, to the Center for Social Change and the Center for Sociological Research, Luke and Trevor, who decided to join forces with us, um, and to all of you who have shown up, who are gonna be here with us today, who are gonna participate. Um, I'm sure you all know the program, so I don't want to go through that as of yet. Um, and would just like to welcome you all here. And I thought that before we began with the, mo the morning's proceedings, it would be important to remember why we're here today. And it would be appropriate to give a moment of silence, a moment of honor, a moment of recollection, a moment of solemnity to the people whom died and the people whom we hold in mind, whom we hold in heart, and whom we hold in soul. So before we have a moment of silence for the 47 people that perished, particularly the 34 miners who were killed on the copies, and also the 13 who died in the days leading up to the 16th of August, 2012, I thought it would be good to read a passage from this book. I'm sure you all recognize this book by Professor Julian Brown, who I hope will be present here today. And I picked it off my shelf the other day and decided to dive back in to to try and recall in as much detail what happened on that day. And I think it's important to try and set the scene, to remember that moment. I want you all to think about where you were, how you first heard the news, and what you felt. Because 10 years later, as we are going to reflect today, as we are going to discuss, nothing has happened, justice has not been served on the families, and the country that we all want to contribute to is still very much in suffering. So before we have that moment of silence, I'd like to read the following passage. On the afternoon of the 16th of August, 2012, officers of the South African Police Services shot and killed 34 striking mine workers at a platinum mine in Marikana. The men were killed in two phases. In the first of these, the police officers took aim at a moving group of workers, and in the course of eight seconds, fired 284 rounds of live ammunition at them. 17 men were killed. Most had been at the front of the group, but others were several hundred meters away, far from the police line. Many of these men died quickly. Some, though, bled to death in the dirt over the next hour, while the police denied them access to medical attention. The police then left the initial site of the shooting and followed a smaller group of workers to a nearby cluster of rocks and boulders. They surrounded these men as they hid and again opened fire. Some police officers fired indiscriminately in the direction of the rocks. Others climbed into the larger boulders and aimed downwards, shooting at the men crouching below. Another, set, another 17 men were killed in this, the second phase of the massacre. Marikana. Again, most died quickly. Again, others bled to death in the dirt. Still others died later in custody. This was the worst abuse of power since the end of apartheid, the bloodiest display of the state's ability to do violence to its citizens in almost 20 years. We think of the 34 
and we think of the 13, and we have a moment of silence in remembrance of them. May their memories be a blessing. Thank you once again. And I now would like to welcome Claire, who's going to chair our first panel, which will feature Shaira Kala, Nadara Munshi, as well as Yanda Steelman. Claire, over to you. Um. Thanks so much, uh, William. So will our first speakers join me up here at the front, please? And we can sit and um, start our discussion. Hi, Shira. Hi, welcome. Um, so thank you very much for being here. Um, to our speakers who I will introduce now, but also just to echo what William said, thank you for being here. Um, thank you for this beautiful opening. Um, it, it, it just makes me so happy to see that there's a child in the front here. Um, I think that's so special. And um, I heard once from an elder that in Africa, we Africans, we sing when we are happy, we sing when we are sad, we sing when we're mourning, and so I think opening the session with the singing and dancing was just uh, so poignant. Uh, like um, William said, my name is Claire Lester. It's really great to meet all of you after three years of us really having no or very little connection due to the COVID pandemic. So <clears throat> when we were planning this seminar, uh, this symposium, we really wanted to try and have this in person, and it is absolutely wonderful to see people here in the flesh, seeing people's faces um, with whom um, I've been connecting and uh, dialoguing for some time. So that's really special. Thank you so much. So I will introduce um, these uh, wonderful <clears throat> speakers um, for our first panel. We have um, on the far end there, uh, Ziander Stürman, she is a policy and security analyst and author of the book, Can We Be Safe? The Future of Policing in South Africa. She is an alumni of the Shevening and Fulbright Scholarship Programs and currently works as a policy manager at the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab at UCT. The article, oh, I, should, I should probably say that this symposium uh, had two parts to it. Uh, the one is what you're in, uh, participating in right now, our in-person uh, symposium. But uh, we also had uh, most of the speakers uh, write short articles or interventions in the days leading up to the, the week um, of the Marikana massacre. So those are on the publication, online publication, Africa is a Country. Um, and if you would like to read them, you may do so. And the article that Ziander wrote is uh, titled Confronting Police Power. Um, we then have sitting next to her, Sha'ira Kala. Um, she is a former leader of Fees Must Fall and is currently an activist and filmmaker based in between Johannesburg and Pretoria. The article that she wrote and which she will be uh, reflecting on today is her article, Dreaming of the Green Blanket. Um, and then we have Nadira Munshi uh, sitting here next to me. She's a project coordinator at Global Union Federation Public Service International, and she has worked in the social justice and NGO sector for some time, particularly in the labor movement, dealing with issues uh, related to access to socioeconomic rights and work around the right to pro protest, um, and was also involved in the Marikana Commission of Inquiry. So thank you so much. Uh, the formats that we're going to be doing, we do uh, we did start a bit later than planned. So I'm going to ask if that's um, all right with you, 
um, for each speaker to, to, to speak for about 10 minutes, um, after which I, might, I will ask a follow-up question. Um, and then we will open the floor for questions or interventions um, from the public. Um, and I just request that they <clears throat> keep relatively short to allow um, for as many people to contribute to the discussion as possible. So I'm going to stop speaking now and sit down. Um, do you have one? May I pass you? There we go. And we've got a bottle of water. Okay. And hello, everyone online who's <laughs> watching via the streaming link. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to begin with Zianda. I think we will move in this direction. That's okay. Zianda, if you'll please. We go. This should be on. Yeah. All right. All right. So thank you, Claire, for that introduction, and thank you, everyone, uh, for attending today and uh, joining online. Um, as Claire mentioned, uh, I wrote a piece uh, for Africa as a country for today specifically, um, and the piece really centered around the idea of trying to confront police power. We know that the SAPS is an incredibly large organization, employs about 186,000 people, uh, of which are 160,000 police officers, um, and has a, a budget, an annual budget of over 95 billion rand a year. I opened the piece by writing, um, writing about the killing of Ndogozi Sindumba. Uh, this was on March 10th, uh, right here in Johannesburg, very close to this location. Uh, his death was caused by public uh, order policing officers uh, firing rubber bullets um, on a crowd of, of uh, students who were protesting fee increases um, and shot him at close range. Uh, despite there being material evidence and witnesses at the scene linking the actions of those officers to his death, uh, the four officers who were charged with murder and attempted murder in his case were acquitted of all charges on July 5th, 2022. Ndumba's killing and the abject failure of the police to be handled uh, or to be held accountable for the spectacular levels of violence they visit upon some groups of people uh, when they protest is one of the most enduring legacies of the massacre at Maragana. Police training and ultimately police conduct within uh, public order policing has never been perfect, but at the very least, it was meant to draw a hard line between what was the old South African police and the new or so-called new South African police service post-1994. The idea was that these police officers were not, uh, or were not able to or not meant to trample on the constitutionally con uh, guaranteed freedom to assemble, to gather peacefully, to protest, to picket and to mass mobilize. Once the massacre at Marikana happened, this nascent understanding of our freedom of pro uh, to protest and the expectation of the police to act with appropriate restraint all but vanished. The country watched, uh, as uh, William pointed out earlier, the country watched as 34 men were gunned down, 78 were seriously injured, and more than 250 were arrested. All of this on camera and all of this clearly showing police using both rubber bullets and live ammunition. Although police claimed that the miners were uh, aggressively threatening them, not a single police officer was injured that day. Since then, thousands of protests have taken, uh, uh, taken place across the country every year, and there, have thousands, and there have been thousands of complaints laid with the Independent Police Investigative Directorate. This body is meant to be uh, the group uh, that performs uh, the duty of watchdog of the police. But really this shows a high number of police officers being charged with excessive force during protests and during crowd management uh, situations. This includes the, the indiscriminate use of rubber bullets and live ammunition in these situations. There are, uh, like I said, currently thousands of civil claims against the police, amounting to 16 billion rand to date. If we were ever under the, the belief that the police could learn to respect the democratic right of protest for poor and working class black South Africans, the massacre at Marikana proves otherwise. The killing of Andres Tatane during a service delivery protest in the Northwest in 2013 proves otherwise. Police action during the Fees Must Fall and Roads Must Fall protests in 2015 and 2016 proves otherwise. And the killing of Dogonzi Sindumba in 2021 proves otherwise. In the way that our entire society is set up to privilege, uh, to favor, excuse me, privilege and wealth, 
our policing system does the same. The SAPS is a reflection of our racist, anti-poor and misogynist society, and this is often reflected in whose right to assemble and whose right to protest and whose right to air their grievance is protected. As I laid out in my piece for Africa as a Country, the SAPS is perfectly capable of policing even violent protests, so long as the people who are protesting are white farmers in Senegal, or so long as they are suburban parents in Brackenfell in Cape Town. They reserve a specific kind of gratuitous violence in almost every other circumstance, and, and uh, much so we've seen since Maragana, by using rubber bullets or, or other so-called less lethal weapons as the first resort and not the last resort. I also want to add that the police act in this way because they are enabled by the state. This is very clearly, um, uh, or this was very clearly in, uh, sorry, we saw this very clearly in the collusion between government and the owners of Lundman in July and August 2012, and we have seen it many times since in the deaths of Petrus Michels, Alma Robin Monzumi, and Collins Koza at the hands of the SAPS, the Johannesburg Metro Police Department, and the military during lockdown in 2020. We also saw this again in August 2020 when, it, when Nathaniel Julius was killed by police in uh, El Dorado Park and the Gauteng provincial government and police tried to lie about the cause of his death. In the deaths of all these South Africans, not a single police officer or member of the military was held accountable for their use of excessive force. With the underfunding and under-resourcing of IPID and no political will to address police brutality, accountability within the SAPS is theoretical at best and treated with contempt at worst. At this point, we no, we no longer need more commissions. We no longer need more empty commitments and promises to weed out violent police officers. What we do need are fewer armed police officers on the street who act with complete and utter impunity. I hesitate to even say that public order policing is broken because at this point it seems to be working by design. It works to harm and cajole and kill those who threaten the capitalist state, uh, status quo and it works to suppress the freedom to protest and to organize for those who challenge state and police power. If we do not have a police leadership and rank and file that understands uh, the situation at hand and reorients the SAPS to an organization that understands its democratic duties in our country, then the massacre at Madakana will continue to reverberate in small and big ways every day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Siander. <clears throat> um, Shira, if you would. Uh, I think now it works. Um, thanks so much, Claire, um, and thank you, uh, Ziander. I've I've read your piece and I've been thinking a lot about this um, since we all we had our own experiences with the police during Freeze Must Fall and. It's very emotional being here today because the last time I spoke at this venue, well, okay, not the last time, but the last time I spoke about these issues at this venue um, was actually in 2016 after um, the police had rounded us up um, in a way that is not comparable to the brutality that um, our miners faced in Marikana, but that really exhibited um, the agenda, um, that the system isn't broken, the policing system isn't broken, uh, it's working the way that it was designed to work, except that the legacy of Marikana and the, the massacre itself, you know, the, the historical moment that this represents is not just in that these miners were shut down mercilessly um, and they their, their, their struggle for a living wage and for better lives, not just a living wage, for, for better lives, was, was really in that after they were killed, the movement continued. And 10,000 miners, you know, came out and the, the, the strike continued. And for me, that just represents not only the, 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 despair of, of Marikana and the story, but 
what the energy and the program of action and the strategy, um, you know, the, the, the beauty in that momentum and, and what the miners were able to galvanize. And it gives me a lot of hope um, in the most difficult times. But I've been asked to reflect a bit about um, the student movement. And um, if you read the piece that I wrote for Africa as a Country, I do talk about um, the way in which the miners taught us as young people. Um, I think I was, I was maybe 19 when this happened. And I was a first year at Fitz University. Um, I won't go into where I was and what I was doing because a lot of it is much of a blur, but I do remember feeling extremely, extremely angry at what was happening. Confused as well, because there were so many mixed messages about what actually transpired. Um, and now that the picture is so much clearer, and it was maybe a year after that I started reading stories, I know there was that unforgettable piece um, that was in the Mail and Guardian about the families of the min miners one year after the massacre. And there was the amazing work that people like Nadira and <coughs> Nomzamo did with Seri <laughs> that educated a lot of us about what we needed to do following the massacre. And so are my activist trajectory is very much entangled in that moment and in that education um, and in seeing what civil society was able to do at that point. Um, and it did something for us as young people. It made us believe that history is something that you create. Um, because a lot of the time when we read about massacres of the past, during the anti-apartheid struggle and even before that, um, the Haitian revolution even, you, you read about it as a distant thing. Whereas this was something that we could see on television. We watched Miner Shut Down. We watched Strike a Rock um, much more recently, which, which focused on women in Marikana. Um, and it took me to that moment when we were singing Senzenina at the gate of Yale, uh, at, at um, the Yale entrance at Bits University. We're singing this song. And as we were singing that song and shutting down the university, we were reverberating the echoes of history from the Soweto uprising and from the copy. And the copy was visible to us because we had seen it. We had seen the mine workers singing it there. And we had seen Joseph Matunjwa saying to them that comrades, the life of an African person in South Africa is cheap. That word, chipile, it stuck with me. And uh, Mamdani, in his book, Neither Settler Nor Native, he refers to three phases in our history that really changed the story for us as South Africans. The turn from resisting within the terms set by the apartheid government and redefining those terms. The second is a shift from demanding an end to apartheid to providing an alternative to apartheid. And the third was a shift from representing the oppressed black majority to representing the whole people. And I think for us, when we were students at that time, um, what happened in Marikana and what was happening at the university as well with the calls for an end to outsourcing that had been 15 years in the making through the Worker Solidarity Committee was this idea that we needed to, um, you know, shift from representing uh, just one group of people, just students. We were not just students. We were members of society before we were students. And that meant that so the solidarity with workers was not just uh, their movement and our movement, but one movement. Um, and now, as I think about the limitations of that time, because in many ways, Fees Must Fall didn't live up to the expectations of, that, of, that, uh, of, the, of the energy that we were able to galvanize in that moment. For me, it represents sort of a moment rather than a, 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 a movement. And, and, and we can debate that, but unfortunately, as someone who was involved and in, 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 in left the space feeling very uh, sad, somber about what was possible, but also in some ways hopeful, um, we, we do need to rethink how we, how we uh, bring people into a space, how we galvanize energy. Um, and for me, it's not just workers and students, but it's people involved in economic and social reproduction in the informal sector. Those who are unemployed because 
That is actually most of us in this country. And those who are neat, you know, not in employment, education, or training, the 15 million people aged 15 to 64 um, in South Africa. And I think this 15 million uh, uh, figure, or 40% of, of people between the ages of 15 to 64, it's, it translates to the potential that we have to really, really, really um, get behind goals and strategies and plans that are not just sporadic and jail, like this is happening here and that's happening there, but actually what we have to do to build an alternative reality and a, an alternative vision. Because what Mamdani says is that one of the main shifts was when we stopped demanding just for an end to apartheid, but we provided a vision for what would replace it. So we went from what needs to fall to what needs to rise. And to me, that is a major thing. Even considering uh, the issues around not just race and gender, uh, but provincial migration, and how that impacts how we organize. Um, and finding that in our intellectual and academic spaces, we need more research that is linked to grassroots movements. Because that is, that is the exception rather than the norm where we find ourselves right now. And it's the reason why I think civil society is in such a weak position. And there are people who've done this, even during Marikana, uh, you know, during the protests at that time, during the strike at that time, there were people who were the minority who were trying to, t to show the truth, right? And so are we witnesses to the truth right now? Are we doing everything in our power right now? I know for sure I'm not doing everything in my power. But the fact that we can see what was possible at that time and the impact that people had after this tragic event, after this massacre that was planned and orchestrated, um, and, and yet it, it didn't, that the, 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 the collaboration between the state and between um, Lonmen uh, and, and, and capital, it wasn't able to crush this movement. There is something really, really, really powerful in understanding how that was possible. And I don't want to uh, drone on too long, but there's one thing that I have to also just speak to is that, you know, um, Professor Kate Alexander in, um, in, her, in, in the book that was written collectively with other scholars, um, writes that the leaders were elected on the basis of their historical leadership in recreational spaces, in community and workplaces. Mambush, you know, our comrade in the green blanket, who I still dream about, got his nickname from the sundown soccer player named Mambush Mudao, and he was chosen since he had organized soccer games and was always resolved, uh, he always resolved minor problems in the workplace and was particularly known for his mild temperament and for his conflict resolution skills, both in the workplace and in his home in the Eastern Cape. You know, these were not just miners, they were not just workers, they were incredible, generous, giving, soft, strong human beings. And there's so much to embody from their characteristics, from the way that they did things, from the way that they were able to galvanize this moment. And I don't think we focus enough on that when we talk about Marikana. Often we just focus on the tragedy of it. And Kolega Putuma's poetry from Collective Amnesia, she says that, isn't it funny that when we ask about black childhood, all they are interested in is our pain, as if the joy parts were accidental. And for me, when I'm reading about the stories of these mine workers and their families, um, Tabiso Telejane was 56 when he died at Lonman, and he was an out-of-contract worker. So neither his son, Copano, nor his daughter, Ketso, qualified for the lifetime education benefits the company promised children of the miners who were killed, right? And that you know, is something that we have to grapple with, we have to deal with. I know Seri is still um, trying to change that uh, and trying to create, to, 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 to um, to, to facilitate justice for these, for these uh, families. But when his wife speaks about the Falem Commission of Inquiry, her voice cracks and she says, I don't know if the truth will come out of the commission. It's still sitting, it hasn't disappeared, but they are still killing witnesses. And this was said after one year, right? So this is one story, but I think the message is important in that 
commissions in themselves and the routes that we have taken or the routes that the country has taken to try and grapple with what, what happened at the Marikana massacre, they really, if we think about the inquest of Ahmed Timor and into his, into his murder, commissions are essentially an act by a particular class in society to maintain the status quo. We saw the same thing with the Fees Commission after Fees Must Fall. It actually recommended a, a structure that would center uh, students taking on debt. It was completely devoid of any of the demands that were made for decommodification and decolonization of education. So when, um, I think one of the lawyers who was representing the workers' families said to us that at the commission, uh, the judge, um, um, Falem actually referred to uh, the wives of uh, the minors as unsophisticated and uneducated. Mm. How do we respond to that? What are we saying, what are we doing to make sure that we um, amplify the voices of these women who, I, th their strength is, 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 is something I can't even grapple with, I can't even understand. I mean, just reading about how some of the wives have said that they will take the place of their uh, husbands and, and, and work at the mines. After everything that has happened, I can't, I can't understand how someone has it in them to make a decision like that. The desperation, the poverty, and yet also the resilience that it takes to, to say something like that and to be willing to do something like that. And you must remember going into the mines, even if we take away the, tra the, 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 the massacre and the, the trauma of the massacre, just going down into a mine, the air that you breathe, the destruction that it has on your lungs, that in itself, you know, is that that violence, before even the violence of the massacre, that violence of just having to do that. How are we talking about that in the aftermath? So these are the kind of things that are, are, are filling my mind right now. And I really hope that as civil society, as comrades, we can we can galvanize around a particular a particular vision for what we want instead of, 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 of talking about particular issues. But how are all of these things linked? And that's where I think a lot of our energy needs to go into because there are programs right now on the ground that are completely devoid of any progressive fiber uh, that are focused on division, that are focused on hate, on xenophobia, um, and that do not speak to the, the spirit of Marikana that do not speak to the lives that were sacrificed that day. And they were definitely not sacrificed in vain. That we can assure everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shira. So much, so such rich uh, interventions. Um, Nadira, um, if you will speak and then I'll, I'll, I'll pop a question or two, but. The interventions have been so thorough. I don't even know if I need to ask questions. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and um, thank you to the panelists, because those were enriching uh, contributions. Yeah. Let's just OK. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. OK. Um, so thank you uh, for inviting me. The piece that I wrote for Africa as a Country speaks to labor. And it's a little bit of a lament uh, on where we are as a labor movement. Before I get there, I want, um, the topic or the title of this discussion is on justice for Marikana. And so I want to speak a little bit to that and kind of end off um, with the piece that I wrote about. Um, and perhaps it's worth uh, following from Shaira to speak a bit about the spirit of Marikana. Um, <coughs> because Marikana was a labor strike. It was a labor strike for living wages. Um, wait one minute. So it was a labor strike for living wages where mine workers went out on strike um, and also reflected on their living conditions um, as migrant laborers living in an informal settlement, so in shacks in Marikana, working for a mine that had enough money to pay them living wages, but we chose not to and refused to do so. And this labor strike led 40 mine workers dead, including one union leader, two security workers, and two policemen at the end of the week. And 
But the deaths and the ways in which the 34 mine workers, which we saw, actually we only saw 17 being killed on TV. And that was the first volley of fire within eight seconds that 17 workers were killed. And then what we didn't see on TV, but we saw mostly through the commission, was how a further 17 workers were gunned down by the police, often surrendering. And so if you look at their post-mortems, a lot of the bullets were in their hands and their elbows because they were surrendering as the police shot them. Um, and if you listen to testimony from mine workers like um, Comrade Nchamba, who was at the, uh, who gave testimony, they speak about how workers killed and how night right next to them, and they were trying to surrender. Um, and then we saw 270 mine workers um, arrested, right? So there were workers who, were, who made up the injured and arrested group, and they were arrested for common purpose for killing, for the police killing their own comrades. So. This is the kind of severe injustice, um, but that killing and the literal loss of blood I affected everyone across the country. So what we saw was workers rise up and recognize the call for a living wage, and we saw more strikes happening. But it went beyond labor. We saw communities in informal settlements rise up and also identify with the struggle or in the living conditions of workers in Marikana. And as I was driving here this morning, we got news that another Abathlali member was martyred this morning. Then Nakutli Mguni died. He's the third person this year to be killed. Nakutli Mguni, Ayanda Ngira, sorry, and then Nakutli Mguni. Murdered for a struggle for housing. This is the dignity that we are not affording people of this country. They are dying for dignity, and they are dying for a struggle. And he was killed at, I think it was 1.30 in the morning. Um, and obviously, we know that there is no justice for the murders that are happening uh, to Abathani members. Because it is, there's a lot of politics involved. We know our government does not care and is involved. Um, and we know that this is a struggle, an ongoing struggle for living wages. Now, the mine workers in Marikana are also migrant labor. They live in very similar conditions in informal settlements. They are also struggling for land, they are struggling for electricity, and they are struggling for access to water. Um, and they are also then forced into a situation where they go underground, as Shaira said, under severe working conditions where you don't know if you're going to come out alive. First, health and safety in mining remains a concern in this country. You come out, and then you're not paid a dignified wage where you can support your family. So post Marikana, um, we have family members, as Shaira said, working at the mines. Now, these women are working. Some have gone underground. I think there are about eight, I stand to be corrected, still working underground. Many of the families are so, not many. Some of them are working above ground. Um, and they had to leave their homes to become the breadwinners of their families and continue, as Namzamo pointed out last night, the trajectory of and the legacy of migrant labor. It just continues. We're not breaking the cycle. We're not breaking the system. And so when we talk about justice for Marikana, we need to look at the companies that are earning thousands of money. AIDC made, did amazing work on the illicit financial flows and the amount of money that they are skimming and just sending off to countries so they can actually afford to pay workers living wages. We need to look at the political elite who are so invested in mining, earning profit from mining companies. The founder of the NUM, criminalized a labor strike that led to the death of 37 mine workers at Marikana, um, killed by the police, right? That's 37 workers killed by the police because three were killed on the 13th of August. He is not the only one who has shares in mining companies, and he's not the only one who has shares beyond the mining interest in business in general. And so he's not the only, he, there are many of our politicians who are part and parcel of companies who outsource labor, labor brokers. And we know that outsourcing and contractual labor, that is, as she said, Mam Telejani struggled because she never, the compensation was an issue, Lundman was evading responsibility because her husband was a contract worker. He was also old. When you pay loss of support, it's based on also the age of the mine worker. As an old mine worker, loss of support, she didn't, she didn't get anything really. 
nothing that can really sustain her going forward in life. And so when we talk about just the series, like, so it was the loss of support claims that were being paid out. We're still waiting for general damages to be paid out. For the mine workers who were arrested, we know that um, they were paid. But for those who were injured, we know that they, they're still nego negotiating because obviously government does not want to pay the amounts that mine workers are asking. Uh, mine workers like Mzumkolo Magiriwana, who I hope comes later, I haven't seen him here, lives with severe injuries to his body. He was killed. I'm sorry, he was shot. Sorry. Uh, he was shot 14 times, if I'm correct. Um, 10 to 14 times in his body. At scene one, where his comrades around him were killed. Um, we have, uh, when we come back to the legacy of Marikana, we have Ntati Jokanisi, whose son was killed. He's a mine worker. And his grandson was bullied at the boarding school that Laman put them up in. Because, um, and again, I'm taking Mzambi's words. They repeat, he was killed because the narrative um, of the state and the companies at that time was that these were vigilante workers out on strike um, and were violent and dangerous men. He was bullied and he, hang, he hung himself. So there's like the legacy and justice for Marikana. We are so far when it's not just 44 people who were killed, it's 44 and more. There are increased, there are deaths that are ongoing, you know. Um, and, and then finally we had to look at the police and I think Zianda spoke clearly about the failures of the police, public order policing, and the failure of Marikana was that we had no public order policing. We had the tactical response team, we had the um, um, special task force, and we have not had a single police officer who shot a mine worker on the 16th of August enter into any form of disciplinary process. We know the generals on the ground for Mark, Khaled, Scott, all of them. They came to the commission and lied. And one of the things about the commission is that a year into the commission, we finally got to learn the depth of the police lies. And I don't know how this is not a scandal across the country. The ways in which the police covered up, presented evidence before the commission, which was fabricated, proven to be fabricated, um, and they basically tried to attempt to retain the story of these violent men um, um, and, and hide the fact that they killed. Eventually, they didn't even give a justification for scene two because there is none. They should have stopped immediately after scene one, um, and, but they didn't. Um, and they had ordered, ordered mortuary vans in the morning, so they, were, so they knew what was going to happen. It was planned, you know? Um, um, and then um, the commission itself, it's, so when we look at commissions in this country, um, commissions are forms of inquiry that are meant to tell us and give us a, a, a truth, right? It's search for knowledge and truth about what happened. But when you look at the terms of reference, commissions operate in a framework. They are um, instituted by the political elite, so Jacob Zuma uh, announced the commission. The terms of reference are decided by the political elite. So who is, what truth we're seeking, from who we're seeking, who gets heard and seen is decided by the political elite. And in that framework, who was silenced was the mine workers and particularly the community of Marikana who supported the 2012 strike. So we never heard from the women who were there on the 16th of August. Um, and we only heard from the injured and arrested mine workers, not from the 3,000 workers who were with them on strike. Um, we landed with a report that opened up by blaming the mine workers and ended by blaming the mine workers for the strike. We landed with a report that gave us recommendations that have still not been implemented um, or have not been effectively implemented in terms of the public order um, panel. Um, and um, we, we're still landing up with justice. Now the families have called for an apology um, although they do also recognize an apology 10 years later is almost meaningless. However, the demand for official recognition from the state that what happened in Marikana should never have happened is still worth fighting for. We do need that recognition from the state, and they have to provide it. Um, we want the, uh, a monument um, commemorating Marikana. Um, the site of the copy, so if you go down at scene one, uh, where the, the 17 workers were killed, that is kind of being overridden, there's a crawl, so even the site and the place of where these killings are happened have been changing. Um, um, and, and those kind of, um, uh, kind of developments kind of happened very quickly after the massacre. Um, 
And then families also want this, the 16th of um, August to be recognized as a pu public holiday, which Ramaphosa, and sorry, I'll round up in two minutes, <laughs> which Ramaphosa had uh, kind of um, threatened to take away the 1st of May, which is May Day. So you can't take away May Day and give us the 16th of August. We want both days and we demand both days, you know. Um, Marikana is not a replacement for Workers' Day. It's a recognition of a, tra of a massacre that happened in democratic South Africa and that should never happen again. Um, so I want to end off with the kind of speaking to the piece um, where I lamented a bit about labor. I am a trade unionist. Um, one of the things about um, Marikana, which was very frustrating, um, especially in the years following up, was the anti-union propaganda that kind of, and the narrative from the state. Um, there's been changes to labor law which limit the right, right of strike. But I spoke about changes in the labor movement. Um, Comrade Lawrence, forgive me here when I talk about Kasatu as well. So what we saw post Marikana was, um, so firstly the 2014 strike, right? The rise of AMCO on the 2014 strike is also unfortunately the story of the decline and the fall of the NUM. Um, the fall of a union that really in the 80s and 90s as it rose up, gave dignity to black mine workers. Um, living conditions improved with the NUM, working conditions improved with the NUM. The NUM was a union that we all looked up to, that provided leadership even beyond the, the workplace. But post-94, we saw the rise of business unionism creep in. And we saw workers kind of um, no longer identify with the union or no longer have faith in the union. Workers would say things like, unfortunately, um, the union leaders would say that you could only strike for a maximum amount of days. That's not true. We saw union workers not, be, not trust, have trust in their leadership to take forward their demands for a living wage. Um, and one of the things that happened was that in 2012, it started up at Impala, then Donman, then uh, Ang Amplatz. Um, workers went to the unions, uh, uh, wanted a raise. It was not given. But then the category of workers above uh, underground, like rock drillers, um, so the shop stewards, they were given a raise, and that upset workers, uh, rightfully so. Um, and they went out on strike independent of the union. Um, AMCO was started organizing in 2011 at Lonman, and so at the time of the massacre, they were not um, involved in the strike. They did get called in. Um, Matunjwa, I think, really tried to negotiate, and um, but post the massacre, many workers left NUM to join AMCO. Um, within, and, and then went on the strike, the 2014 strike, right? Which was one of the longest strikes, five months, no work, no pay. Um, but we also saw other shifts within the labor movement, and we saw the um, SAFTU um, splitting and forming from Kasatu. And SAFTU, the promise and the dream, was a new social movement unionism, a unionism that would bring us a new way of being, a new way, a new kind of, a return to the proud legacy of trade unionism that we have in this country. Unfortunately, the Second Congress of SAFTU was marred by leadership battles, and we never actually got to the commissions which discussed issues. So I think as labor, and as an advocate for labor, this is not to say we don't need unions. This is to say we absolutely need unions. We absolutely need working class organizations. We absolutely need um, unions that um, that have the legacy of Kasatu, that have the strength of which SAFTU was formed out of, unions that recognize that they are working class organizations, that they provide leadership within the workplace and far beyond into communities, that connect to communities. Um, because these are our, as working class organizations, one of the most sustainable forms of organizing of the working class that we have that has survived throughout history. Um, but we do have difficult questions to ask us about, um, about the state of labor, about where we are internally as labor, but also about the challenges that we're facing, increasing automation, increasing casualization of work, the anti-unionization from the state, um, all of these questions we need to grapple with honestly because we desperately need our unions, but we do need to operate in a different paradigm. And also we have to ask questions if the Labor Relations Act and the labor system in which we worked, we worked in and we pushed for 94 had a place and worked for us, but does it continue to do so? Um, and is it giving us as labor the kind of power and strength that we hoped that it would? So thank you. Thank you.
Um, thank you so much for those interventions. And um, it's always a terrible position being in a chair because the last thing you want to do is stop um, someone from speaking. And so I decided not to because, uh, in, in fact, um, things that I would have wanted to ask were were in fact um, answered by allowing that extra time. So I'm not going to ask you direct questions now, but I am going to uh, give a sort of a general um, <clears throat> overview and some points um, which each of you can re respond to in relation, um, in addition to um, the interventions from the audience. What I picked up in, in each of your interventions was this idea of violence and the multifaceted manifestations of violence, um, one being a kind of structural or more systemic form of violence, and then of course the direct physical violence. Um, and this is something that perhaps you can um, reflect on uh, when other people also ask some questions, but the notion of violence in relation to accountability and accountability for that violence, because as um, Nadira pointed out, legal frameworks only allow for a certain form of accountability for certain types of violence, right, in most cases. So um, I hope that you can uh, speak to that perhaps um, in a bit. Um, another thing uh, which happened when I was recently in a department meeting last week, uh, a faculty board meeting, I don't know if this is confidential, um, but the faculty was discussing that actually for the university to be able to uh, balance its books going forward, there is actually going to be a need for a 13% fee increase, um, which it was assessed, well, of course, this is not This is going to be a problem if we consider that in relation to all the additional burdens on um, citizens or people generally living uh, in this country. Um, so here, this notion of violence comes up again, um, and the futures uh, of South Africa in responding to these kinds of shifts. Um, so if maybe for two minutes each, you can respond to how do you think we can then leverage the power of civil society to respond to these multiple forms of violence? I know they're, they're, it's a big question, but um, to reflect on how we can do that would be great. Um, while you think, perhaps, um, I will open the floor for some questions and interventions, and then you can respond to either that or um, the others. Do we have a roving mic, or should I walk around with the mic? Okay. Um, if you can also introduce yourself, um, that would be great, so that people can know who you are. Uh, Amandla. Um, is, I'm very disturbed. Uh, first of all, during 2012, I was an organizer of Marikana Support Campaign. It was very even difficult to transport food for the mine workers because they were not even working. Um, even today, it's still difficult to solidarize with our Tlova sisters who are fighting at Tlova. The song that says, um, Senzenina, I wish one day one can respond to the question of Senzenina. There is another song that says, Umtomnyama uh, ulalanga lile, meaning as a black child you go bed hungry. And when we try to organize ourselves and unite ourselves, our government is blocking us from uniting ourselves. First of all, Ramaphosa is a black person. What has happened in Marikana up to date when we take it to the streets, he is the one who is organizing police to shoot us. He is the one we voted for him to be the president. Only if we knew we were not going to vote for him. Uh, the slain of Marikana will be a dream for lifetime. I remember when we went down there, Nabosis Nomzamo and others who are in the room, there was blood 
all over and such an extent that I took a resolution that I'll never eat liver because what I saw there, it's still in my face. And between the rocks, there were other scalps which you can tell that these people, they didn't die right. There was something wrong and somewhere and no one cares. And even the report from the Falam Commission, it's about 800 pages and more. And I still feel even today that I wish Sisnomzamo, uh, we can have a radical strategy on holding our um, uh, president accountable with the police that who triggered the bullet on what has happened in Marikana. And I wish, because um, the second speaker mentioned that um, there are some uh, widows who can't even take their kids to school. What does that mean? How do you feel? How do you sleep at night if we have, we are stuck about these issues we, because, for the sake of you? I think organizing ourselves and mobilizing ourselves is the way to go. If we have to be more strategic in blocking this to not to happen, if we can call police now to say, here is the criminal, they won't even pitch. Because they are political bosses, they direct them. They direct them to kill innocent people who are demanding for a mere living wage. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, I can take another uh, another speaker. Oh, okay, uh, thank you. My name is Bigom Tsauro. I'm an artist. I, I want to ask the panelists, um, is there an instance in history, anywhere in the world, where the police have acted in the interest of the working class? That's my first question. Um, and maybe just to substantiate that question, is it not the nature of police to serve the interests of the capitalists, and not just police? Is it not also, is violence not intrinsic to a state? In fact, is there a state that doesn't meet out violence? Which leads me to ask, do we need police and do we need the state? Thank you. Thank you very much. I can take one more before I go back to our speakers. Someone wave. You wave. Thank you. Okay, my name is Palesa Mpashele from Deep Roof Zone 4. Um, I recall very well when the incident of Marikana occurred. I was still at uh, COPE from inception when it first started, which was still burning, okay, <laughs> as an activist. And there was this guy who was like, okay, we should do maybe um, an SMS radio advertisement to say people should like uh, pop in some money to afford these people a decent living so that uh, while this issue is still, you know, at hand being tackled, but nothing was done still till today. So my question is one, we're talking about having a monument. Sorry, I didn't catch your name quite well. Okay, you, you spoke about having a monument for Marikana, which would be a great thing. However, I would like you to um, put yourself in those people's shoes to understand that if somebody is in a state of poverty, doesn't have anything to eat, what should be prioritized then? We have social uh, servants, we have uh, companies around those people. Was there a company that came through and said, okay, let's offer this widow a, a, a job or something, you know? I think we, we haven't really done much as communities or as civil servants to unite our, our people, where we can be able to like uh, not rely more on government, but see, seeing companies like affording somebody a decent life, you understand? Because these people are really suffering. 
imagine being a widow, having three kids who relied on someone with the little they have to survive. But now you have no source of income. You have no one to tend to. Because maybe even your immediate families, they can't even provide. So it's the things that we, we really need to be cautious about. I think we should really uh, prioritize affording these people a decent life before even addressing the case of having a, um, a statue to say, let's recall the events of Americana. That's my plea. Thank you so much. So some questions, some more reflections. Um, so I'll ask uh, the three of you to respond um, as well. I think I don't want to be too rigid about things, you know, kind of making people ask questions and things. This is, I, I think we should respect that it's a different kind of symposium, right? Um, so please do respond. Um, and then, um, yeah, please do respond. Um, yes, Yanda, you can. Um, so thank you for those uh, for those comments and the the questions. Um, I'll take the the first question from the gentleman in the front. Um, you know, I, the question of whether we need the state and whether we need the police uh, is definitely one that that lots of people are grapp grappling with. Um, you know, I think given the the uh, mass movement uh, after the killing of George Floyd in 2020 um, and the sort of resurgence of of Black Lives Matter, and particularly, I think the defund the police movement in the US and in other places, um, I think was really important for essentially making people ask those exact questions. What is the, the place of the state? What is the place of, of the police? You know, I think in, in post-colonial societies uh, such as ours, the fact that the police came out of colonial governments um, and their entire purpose was to protect, uh, you know, what, capital, what uh, colonialists had stolen. Um, you know, by its very nature, we have to question what and how our police system works, and, and by extension, uh, what and how the, the state works. Look, I think that there are, are questions we can ask around uh, accountability within the police, not just uh, in terms of legal uh, accountability or liability, but also what do they do with all the money we give them. Again, we spend 95 billion rand on an enormous police service that in many, many ways, over and over again, is extremely violent to the people uh, that they're meant to protect and serve. I think we really need to start asking hard questions about uh, the more than uh, 20,000 senior police leaders we have, what they do, what value they add to the organization, and why the organization even exists to the point where we're funding it at over 90 billion rand a year, which is a 66% increase, by the way, uh, over the last decade. There's no other uh, social service, at least that I know of, within our government that has had as much uh, uh, you know, monetary investment as the police have, but have delivered so little. Um, so I think that there's, you know, going back to, to Claire's question, I think that there's also something around really specific ways we can hold the police accountable for what they do. So an example of this is uh, banning the use of, uh, of particular rifles in public order policing. There are many, many, many non-lethal weapons that the police can use. Uh, or less lethal weapons that the police can use um, that they should be using and not immediately going towards rubber bullets, which are very lethal at close range. The police know that. Um, uh, rubber bullets or tear gas uh, or uh, live ammunition itself. So I think that, that you know, the, the role of both civil society and I think particularly in terms of civil litigation should really hyper-focus on how we can change the exact nature of public order policing because I promise you now the police won't do it themselves. Thank you so much. Um, Shira, if you can respond now, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, Comrade Nadira touched on it, but something that we also have to understand and deeply consider in the plans that we put together around how we respond and how we build something to galvanize the energy that exists, but I think is not coordinated um, in ways that you know would allow it to be felt um, and to to really shake the core of this unjust system um, is that resource extraction and the violence and the greed that we have seen on on exhibit and we continue to see the deaths continue it's 44 and, and more as comrade Nadara said um, and in that in that same vein not just in Marikana but all over the country there's this violent 
status quo. Um, so resource extraction and the violence um, and the greed that it's underpinned by is, is a worldwide issue. It's not just a South African issue. Um, and the name platinum itself stems from platina or little silver. Um, and in the era of, of the Spanish conquest and the exploitation of South America from the 16th century, this word is actually rooted uh, in, in, in that discovery of, of oppression and colonial expansion. So when we look at where we are now, South Africa is really ripe for change, but we need to understand and not be naive that this change is not predetermined to be progressive change. Um, there's a very nefarious agenda at play as well. Uh, and we've seen societies that completely, you know, go backwards in time and, and regress. Um, and so I think there's a lot of work to be done, of course, but also it, it can't be in the way that we've been working. You know, we, we, we really have to consider how we, we go forward. That for me is important, as important as, as going forward, is how we do that um, and, and what we're, we're building, essentially. So I've been involved in, in, in calls for universal basic incomes, but I'll be the first to acknowledge that a universal basic income guarantee is nothing without consideration of our industrial policy, without consideration of basic services, universal basic services, and unfortunately what we're seeing is a shift away from that towards privatization. Um, so these issues are deeply connected, not just in the issues, but also the fact that people all over the world are dealing with similar problems. Um, if you just look at Colombia, um, the election of um, a left-wing uh, progressive um, indigenous woman uh, is, is now the biggest threat to the mining conglomerates in, in that part of the world. And the mining conglo clo um, conglomerates in that part of the world are, are the same ones you know, that, that we have to deal with here. Um, so I think for me there's two pictures that come to mind in closing. Um, the one is this ethereal picture that was taken uh, a year after the massacre um, of the copy and I think it was at sunrise that this picture was taken. I'll share it with any of you who want to see it but it was a really really beautiful picture. It touched me um, and it made me think about uh, how I felt when I saw the picture of, of, um, of the earth from outside, from, from space. Um, and the idea of an overview effect, which is how small and fragile the sky and the earth look from space, but then also understanding that we really are just in a spaceship called earth, moving constantly. Um, and the molecules in our bodies have been prototyped in some ancient generation of stars. And this reality uh, against the existential tenuousness of black life and where we find ourselves now in our history to protect um, livelihoods, to build livelihoods, uh, to, to, have, to create justice, and to fight against the same interests in the system of extraction and capitalism and imperialism that led to the killing of our miners in Marikana, and that will lead to the ecological destruction of this place that we call home, this planet that we call home. We have to think of a much broader picture. We have to think on a galactic level around um, not being paralyzed by fear uh, in the same way that Marikana miners were probably very fearful of the consequences of what was happening. They had everything to lose, and yet they were brave enough and courageous enough to do what needed to be done. And are we brave enough and courageous enough right now to do what needs to be done? That, for me, is, is, is what we have to think about. Go ahead, Nadir. Thanks. So, Comrade um, Cleo, and it's uh, actually nice to see the end of with Shaira, um, because I think it is about organizing and mobilizing. But um, we also have to take stock of where we are. So, whistleblowers are being murdered, you know? Um, and so when we organize and mobilize, how do we create spaces for people to come forward, safe space to protect them when they do come forward, um, 
we have the constant arrests um, and like we just saw now the murder of a young leader so they're wiping out a generation of leaders in Abaslali who are fighting um, we have arrests I think I saw Kamai General somewhere in, in the room and he was arrested under the Intimidation Act which is an old apartheid act and that went to court you know um, um, and but the point is that we have to continue to organize and mobilize and, and so for example on the 24th we have SAFTU and other unions coming out on a national shutdown we have to support that but I think that there is we also have to be um, honest about how we're building because building also requires uh, a constant work and kind of a slow process of organizing on the ground um, so that when we do these big national actions, we have actually done the groundwork and movement of building and, and um, getting people to build solidarity with one another across struggles and in different parts of the country. And so we do need a national shutdown, but, it ha but we also need to do that kind of slow, organized work. Um, and I think that we do have examples. Abbas Lali, the work that Comrade Cleo and others are doing, uh, Tembet Clear Crisis Committee, uh, Sueto, you know, there's a lot of work being done, but how do we, how do we galvanize and increase that effort? Um, um, and so to come, I mean, I think on the question of the state, um, Zianda, I mean, the questions that you said that people were posing, I think it's important that we have these conversations. Um, and I think she answered it well, so I'll just speak a little bit more to the state and public services. Right now we do have a state. This is the model in which we have. And so I think as we fight for alternatives, we also have to fight for what we have to work for us. And that means returning back to the public. Um, so we are we're in a country that is suffering rising malnutrition. Um, we have a health crisis, we have an education and reading crisis in this country, we have a, a crisis of elderly care, we have a crisis of, um, y y you know, um, uh, so many, <laughs> we have a crisis of violence, right? Um, but public services can help alleviate this. So the kind of notion that you have to be working and you are only productive and worthy of public services when you are working and when you are paying taxes, bullshit in a country where there is such high employment, there is no opportunities or ways to enter employment, um, where we have the state denigrating and kind of trying to kill the informal economy through constant harassing of traders, etc. cetera. Um, we, we have to reclaim our public services and make it work for us. Um, it's the one ways in which, we, and we have to use that to kind of help us to also build to reach a new way forward um, and the kind of South Africa that we do want to see. Um, and um, to come back to your question, I mean, it is the point that we do have women who's, um, and children and brothers and parents and grandparents whose loved ones were murdered by the state who takes no accountability and refuses to even acknowledge that what they did was wrong and murder in the first place. Um, but I do think it's also about um, ensuring that we do preserve our history. And so the question of a monument came from the workers, from the families, and from the community of Marikana. Um, it's something that they wanted. Um, and I think it's important that um, we do put up something that says, hey, what happened here was not right. What happened here should not be repeated. We want something to constantly remind us. And also, we want to remember and remember loudly the names of the men who were murdered uh, and the workers who were murdered at Marikana. So I think it is about balancing, and we can do both. We can demand justice. We can de demand dignified lives. We can demand proper wages, living wages. We can, um, at the same time, um, also stand up and say, never again. Um, Thank you so much. So <clears throat> being the first panel of four, uh, many issues have been raised from the history and the legacy of the state to colonialism, violence, and building social power. And we do hope that all of you stick around. Um, we have um, more panels coming up, which will break off onto different subjects that have been covered. The next one after lunch, we did go a bit into 